Howdy AP Biologists! Uh, welcome to a final review, just kind of a last minute final tips about the test. Uh, some things to remember. I wanted to set you up right, so here we go! Hardy Weinberg problems. You are going to see a Hardy Weinberg problem, and we've done a little bit of review in class, but I want to give you guys the key to success on all of these things. So, uh, the number one thing that I think you remember is you have two two equations. You have P plus Q equals one, uh, where P is the frequency of the dominant and Q is the frequency of the recessive, but most of the time, the number one thing that you're going to need to know is that if they give you the recessive individuals, like non-tasters, um, that, that is something that is often a recessive trait, um, uh, you need to set that frequency, which you find by adding things together and dividing by the total, to Q squared. Q squared is your key. That's a frequency of recessive individuals. Don't use Q. Use Q squared and then take the square root of that to get Q. That's the secret to Hardy Weinberg problems. Chi squared problems. You're going to probably see these too, maybe a couple of times in different formats. Um, remember, if you're going to use this formula, this chi squared equals the sum of the observed minus the expected squared divided by the expected. Um, and remember, the observed is what they actually get from the data. The expected is what you would do either from in animal behavior, you're usually going to set it to just the the average, so it's just five go one way, five go the other way. Uh, in a uh, genetics problem, you're going to set the expected to whatever ratio you would get from the Punnett square. They could use sex linkage, where you have to set up the x and y and the x and the x. They could use um, regular um, or a, a dihybrid cross where it's 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Um, just remember if the chi-square is high, reject the null hypothesis. There's probably some offensive thing that you know um, if the p is low, uh, well if the chi-square is high, reject the null hypothesis or HO. Uh, for animal behavior, remember the null hypothesis are just Differences are due to chance. Uh, just five went one way, five went the other way. They don't prefer one side or the other. With genetics, it's the null hypothesis uh, is that the breeding does follow predicted ratios. So if it's very close to the nine to three to three to one ratio, if it is close to 75, uh, 25 in a, um, a traditional just uh, heterozygous um, double cross. Uh, rejecting a genetics problem is a little tricky because it probably means that there's some different type of inheritance. It isn't the one that was suggested. So that could be because it's on a sex chromosome or it could be linkage. Remember we studied linkage in the fly phenotypes and if it isn't one to one to one to one uh, with the, the linkage, uh, that's probably uh, uh, going to mean that you can reject the null hypothesis and there is linkage. It means they are on the same chromosome. Regulation. We talked a lot about regulation. Um, most regulation is due to transcription factors. Remember we talked about that with cell signaling. Uh, you get something to come to bind a receptor, that's going to cause an amplification and then that's going to make transcription factors which are going to turn other things on. That's how you get the cell signaling pathway. Uh, this is a type of transcription factor, just something that causes transcription to either occur. Uh, if it's an activator or repressor, it won't occur. Uh, but also there's interfering RNA that can come and cause the mRNA to be broken down. Uh, and then also, uh, remember just regulation, P53, it comes up often, is a tumor suppressor. Uh, and if it doesn't work, if it mutates, then you're going to get cancer. Uh, and along the same lines, CDKs, cyclins, if you hear about CDKs or cyclins, they check the cell cycle. If they're not working, uh, then you might get cancer. You might get uncontrolled cell growth or re uh, uh, division. Uh, remember these things. Homeostasis. Uh, that, just think about. Think about homeostasis. That's returning to normal. That's if you have too much of something, it needs to return to a normal set point. And at a molecular level, that's where if you have, if you make something and that activates 
an enzyme and that activates another enzyme which makes something which activates another enzyme. In that process, in that, uh, in that signaling, the, the last product is probably going to block a step earlier. That way you don't continue to make things, make things, make things, make things. You get enough of it, it's going to turn off things upstream so that enzyme stop make, stops making things. Uh, it can also refer to like thermoregulation where uh, if we're too hot, we sweat uh, and our uh, blood vessels dilate. Uh, if we're cold, our blood vessels constrict and we shiver. It keeps us at a normal 37 degrees Celsius or 98 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And hormones are usually involved in return to homeostasis. Remember endocrine signaling, you're going to make something that's going to go to another cell, some other tissue far away. Uh, so that endocrine, uh, it's like insulin. Uh, we didn't talk too much about it, but insulin will lower. Uh, it's, a, it's a hormone uh, um, in the kidney. Uh, uh, you're going to lower, um, you know, keep, keep uh, water regulation in a tight balance. Uh, this is all homeostasis. Uh, thinking about membranes, you need to know uh, why membranes exist. They, they're kind of barriers to make sure that you keep the right stuff in, uh, the wrong stuff out. Uh, small nonpolar molecules, these are like oxygen or CO2, um, they are nonpolar, uh, or other things, they can go right through uh, the membrane. Something else that goes through the membrane but requires a channel is water, remember. That's the whole uh, osmo regulation. Water can go through aquaporins. Uh, but other things, big things, or polar things like epinephrine, need to bind to a receptor. When they bind to a receptor, that's going to cause something else to occur. It can cause a secondary messenger like CAMP uh, to be used, um, but it's going to cause some process to occur and some, some response uh, to occur downstream. Membranes, remember, uh, nonpolar can get through. Polar has to use some other mechanism, some receptor, uh, to, to cause its function or its effect. Cell respiration. You don't have to memorize every single step, but it's good to know what the most important start steps are. And uh, remember, it's occurring in the mitochondria, and the most important part of cellular respiration, where you get the most ATP uh, for your buck, is the electron transport chain and elect oxidative phosphorylation. Um, and specifically, chemiosmosis, remember this is where you form this, this gradient, these electrons coming through, um, you're going to form this gradient of hydrogen ions, and when they go through, they make ATP, through ATP synthase, probably the most famous enzyme. Um, and remember, NADH is used in cell respiration, NADH, which is created uh, it's, it's reduced, remember, uh, it's reduced to make NADH and then later oxidized um, to make NAD+. And if you're trying to remember oxidation versus reduction, which, which one's which, uh, remember um, Leo uh, Ger. Leo says Ger. Leo says Ger. Loses electrons, it's oxidation. Uh, gains electrons. It's reduction. So this is cell respiration, NADH, it's got that extra H, it's, it's electron rich, um, so it has been reduced. Uh, it's oxidized here though. Uh, reduced to make it, oxidized here. Um, that's the electron transport chain. And then quick stuff to know for photosynthesis, remember you have light dependent reactions and then light independent reactions or the Calvin cycle. Uh, light dependent reactions, uh, light comes in, they occur in the thylakoid. Remember thylakoid like thylakoins, a stack of them is like granum, like a silo where you store grain. Um, H2O goes in, oxygen comes out, uh, you're making ATP and NADPH, remember P for photosynthesis, so you don't get them confused. Uh, they go into the stroma, which is just the space. You could take a stroll through the stroma, that's the space. Uh, and that is going to take the CO2, remember plants need the CO2, and it's going to make the G3P, uh, you need two of which to make glucose uh, for them to store it. But also remember that plants do uh, also do cellular respiration, they don't just do photosynthesis. 
Uh, so they will do the process on the last slide, but they also do photosynthesis. And remember, because of this photosynthesis, and actually chemosynthesis as well, this is where we get energy for the sun, so we need lots and lots of photosynthesis in order to support things later uh, or higher up in, uh, in a trophic pyramid. Um, so there's gonna be less things at the top of the pyramid eating things below them. Uh, remember our pyramid. And producers are going to be make up the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, consumers, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary consumers will be at the top, and there's gonna be far fewer of them because of that 10% rule. Only 10% of the available or the energy is available to higher levels uh, to make new biomass. Um, so remember, they lose 90%, they keep 10% as you go up the pyramid. So finally, I just wanted to say, everyone, that I'm really proud of you. You guys worked really hard this year. Uh, we learned a lot. Uh, we did a lot of great experiments. Uh, and I really want to say, uh, really proud of you, Caroline, Ben, Mark, Katie, Jesse, Martina, Sean, Kyle, Andrea, Lauren, Halen, Mia, Stephanie, Adrian, Johnny, and Lexi. Go out there, kick this test in the teeth. I know you can do it. I'm already very proud of you.